Why bother cleaning your car when you know it'll be dirty again tomorrow? What should you do if your partner has a habit of never ordering a dessert in a restaurant and then eating half of yours? They're not exactly the burning questions in life, but it would be nice to know the answers. And Tim Harford, otherwise known as the undercover economist of the Financial Times newspaper, has made a career out of trying to find out. I began by asking him why it is that people always crowd around the doors of a train, not giving people space to get off, when they know they'd get on faster if they did leave that space. Well, I do argue that people tend to behave rationally, and I don't think the scarce resource, in the case of trains, is getting on the train quickly and getting the train to leave quickly. The train's going to leave when the train leaves. The scarce resource is to get a seat. So, even if the train itself is somewhat delayed, if you can be ahead of the other people getting on the train, if you, you'll get a seat on a train delayed by five seconds or ten seconds. And sadly, people are often selfish, so that's what they do. The person who wrote and asked me that question also claimed that he'd seen the same behaviour in the case of elevators, uh, which of course have no seats. And I have to say, I've never ever seen people pushing to get into an elevator. People are always scrupulously polite when it comes to elevators because there's nothing to be gained from being selfish. OK, can I ask another one? Why bother washing your car when you know it'll be dirty again tomorrow? This was a most perplexing reader query. I told him, um, or I asked him, didn't the same argument apply to teeth? Why would you brush your teeth? They also will be dirty tomorrow. Um, bizarrely, as with so many things, there is actually an economic theory of this. Um, it's to do with the appropriate cash balances that we hold. You go to a, a bank or to an ATM, you take out cash, and then you'll slowly deplete the cash, and there will come a point where you don't have enough cash to buy what you want to buy, and you have to go back to the bank. And the question is, what's the optimal pattern of cash withdrawals? And the answer is, well, you, you always want to withdraw substantially more cash than you need, so that on average, you'll have the correct amount of cash. So you get this sort of sawtooth model. Uh, and I argue exactly the same thing uh, should apply to washing your car. The car should be cleaner than you would want. It should be extravagantly, embarrassingly clean. Uh, and also haircuts. When you cut your hair, you should always make sure your hair is substantially shorter than you really want it, so that it will be, on average, the correct length. And when you think about it, most people actually do this. Who writes these letters to you? Are they really genuine? Because I know that you had one recently from someone asking whether the prostitution industry was going to suffer as a result of this economic downturn. Well, that, that one was certainly genuine. Or, well, actually, I don't know if it was genuine. All I know is I didn't write it. No one at the Financial Times wrote it. Um, it was certainly somebody claiming to be uh, an escort uh, in Canary Wharf. And most of the letters are genuine. When the column was new six years ago, obviously no one knew who we were. We had to make up quite a few letters. But now they're almost all genuine, and the, especially the ones you think are made up, I can't make those up. They're the real ones. What are the really important economic questions, the big questions that you wish someone would write in with? I don't necessarily want to answer the important questions. Actually, I feel there's, there's a bit of a, I suffer from a bit of a split personality. Dear Economist uh, is, is not really answered by Tim Harford. It's, it's answered by my evil twin. That there's this little imp inside me who has read far too much economics, who, uh, unlike me, um, is uh, willfully rude to people, uh, delights in using jargon. Uh, and that's the character who answers these, these letters rather unsympathetically. And then there's, then there's everyday Tim Harper, there's me, who I've, well, at least I try and be nice, I try and be polite, I try to explain things simply. Uh, and I'm interested in, in bigger topics. So I just have to, to juggle those. At the moment I'm feeling the, the split personality particularly acutely because I'm working on a book that at least aspires to be very serious. It's a book about how complex problems are solved. Um, it's a book that looks at what happened to the counterinsurgency effort in Iraq. It's looking at efforts to stop climate change. It's looking at efforts to promote new technologies like a vaccine for AIDS. The financial crisis, uh, of course, all the really big complex problems. And so my day job is to, to bury my head in this research and to try and produce this book. But of course, Dear Undercover Economist has just been published. So uh, the evenings, like now, I'm turning up and I'm telling people about the economics of uh, 
Brazilian waxes or, or the economics of speed dating. And I have to, to just cope with those things in my head at the same time. The book you're preparing, the one on these big questions, what are you looking for? Are you looking to develop a theory to solve these problems? Well, yes, ideally. But of course it would be presumptuous to think that I'm going to solve them all by myself. Um, but I'm hoping that my approach, which of course is not completely original to me, I, you know, I read a lot of other economists, I have intellectual influences, but my approach, I would hope, is going to be A, interesting to readers, so people will enjoy the book and they'll think about these problems in a different way, but I hope also it will, it will get some political attention. Uh, I, I know that we've had books like Free Economics that have had very wide acclaim in the past few years, but we've also had books like Nudge that have been widely read and noticed by politicians. And, and so I think a good economics book, even if it has popular aspirations, can also be influential. And that, that's what I would hope for. Hopefully, I'll have some of the right answers and, and people will pay attention. Yes, in the book you've just published, Dear Undercover Economist, what's your favourite question? Well, there was a question that came to me when I only just started writing the column and absolutely knocked me for six. Uh, here it is. Uh, Dear Undercover Economist, I am 74, vigorous, wealthy and boringly married. My girlfriend of eight years, who is 37, has found a man of her own age of moderate means. She has assets of £300,000 and a salary of about £50,000. I had intended to give her £250,000 and would still do so if she continued a discreet relationship with me. What do you think? Mr Smith, London. What are you going to do with that? Is there any area of life where you will admit that economics has no place? Uh, there may be areas of life where economics has no place, but I refuse to admit it. Uh, I'll, I'll always try. The, the letters that I don't answer are the letters about what should I do with my um, investment trust, or is now a good time to invest in the stock market. Those, those ones, they're, they're interesting questions. They interest me, but they're not dear economist questions. But anything else so far is fair game. One last question. What should you do if your partner has a habit of never ordering a dessert in a restaurant and then eating half of the one that you order. There is a famous uh, Valentine's Day paper by Ted Bergstrom called Love and Spaghetti, which is all about the problem of dividing uh, a, a good, for example, a, a line of spaghetti, but it could be a, a slice of chocolate cake, uh, between two lovers, it's called the Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and he goes through he goes through all the maths. Um, it's actually an exercise for the diligent student. But the the practical upshot of all this is that it's very difficult to get it exactly right. If the lovers are largely selfish, they'll each want more cake themselves. If the lovers are largely selfless, that doesn't actually solve the problem because each one will be trying to push the chocolate cake on the other. There's there's only one point, the bliss point, where they absolutely agree they're equally selfish and selfless and they agree exactly about how the, the cake should be divided. But to work out what bliss point is takes more maths than I would care to use on a romantic evening. Tim Harford, thank you.